Maine was very good for John's work. And, um, most of the show that Karen has mounted is post-2002, which I just wanted to mention. He went to Ireland. He got a fellowship at Bali Glen Art Foundation in 2002. He went and he, um, it, he got very sick with some sort of respiratory. And he was running a high fever and he uh, mixed up big bowls of paint and really went at it with wide brushes. You know, he was going to paint no matter what. But he had panels and it's, and he had. had I mean, John had started working on panels because they're poke proof. And they didn't want Gabe to feel like he had to be careful to be not into them, which he did get on. But. So those were what he took to Ireland. And it really revolutionized the last period from 2002 onward. Well, I started with John in 2009. Um, the Stonington Pain Workshop was um, well established by then. A lot of the people that were in the workshop by the time I started had already been with John for a good 10 years or so. Um, so it was a bit intimidating for me. I was, um, I heard about John in 2008 and um, I was painting these sweet little landscapes from photographs and I was very bored with my work. And so I knew I wanted to make some changes. And I heard about John, I saw his work and I thought, wow, this is really what I need to do. So I called him in 2000, I, I emailed him in 2008 to find out information about the workshop. And um, I thought maybe he'd wanna see my work first to kind of vet me to see if I would be appropriate for the workshop or whatever. And I got an email back from him within an hour and it said, we're right in the middle of the workshop this week. Why don't you come down and check us out? And I was so shocked by that. And um, I think that that just describes John in a nutshell, as far as I'm concerned, very accessible, always wanting to share everything he knew. He really had, he, as I think Jill described it well, he's very confident about his work, uh, but he had no ego either. He was always willing to share. And um, so I knew I was gonna be in the right place. I started in 2009. Um, I was still working a day job in 2008. So, um, uh, so that's how I got started. Um, a lot of people ask me to describe how he taught his way of teaching. And it's, I think, very difficult to describe because Unlike any other workshop I ever took, there was no syllabus. There were no material lists. Uh, he didn't care how you set up your palette or what you had on your palette. Um, and there were no assignments. You just showed up and painted. And the only thing that he asked of us was to push ourselves and to work outside of our comfort zone. And um, that's, pretty much what we did. And um, a typical day would be, we would go to the first, the first day we'd go out to Sand Beach almost every single year, everyone would go to Sand Beach. And his assignment for that day was to just paint a beautiful painting and get it out of our system. Because he wanted the rest of the week to be challenging um, ourselves and not being afraid to paint um, work that wasn't great. We just wanted to um, challenge ourselves. So that's, he would come around to us probably twice in the day. You'd get to see him while you're painting and um, give us tips, give us a little critique. Um, and then at the end of the day at four o'clock, we'd all meet in his studio for our group critique. And that's really where I think all the learning happened because he took each painting individually and discussed it at length, what was working, what wasn't. Um, he brought in art history references when he was talking about composition or color, uh, paint handling. It was 
an intense two hours often uh, critique. And um, he seemed, he recognized that each of us had our own voice. And even if we didn't think we did yet, um, he, he recognized it and he seemed to, for me, he seemed to have a way of nurturing that and um, sort of being able to figure out what we wanted to do before we even knew what we wanted to do. I, I, it's very difficult to articulate, um, but he was a very nurturing teacher and he um, really encouraged us all to be individuals. Really no one came out painting like him. Um, so that was basically, uh, oh, and the demos too. He always did one, at least one demo a week, sometimes two. And it was mesmerizing to watch him paint. That's all I can say. <laughs> and um, I, I can still see it as clear as day, is doing the demos. Do um, you have anything to add to that, Jill? Or... Yeah, you know, once John got something under his belt, he was no longer interested. He wanted to be constantly challenging himself and he was very organized in his daily life, very committed, responsible, organized, got all the paperwork out of the way. And I was always going, geez, it's a beautiful day. Why don't you get out of here? And, um, but he liked to clear his head space and then he would just go and he was the most daring and courageous painter I've ever seen. And if it was feeling too safe, he'd flip the painting over and he'd wipe it out or just start again with that as a base and put himself out in Netherland and find himself again. The struggle was implicitly important to the resolution of the work. And um, I don't know a more courageous painter. And I've been very impressed with Linda's work and how she's just put herself out there. And I really, it's a good show. If you haven't seen you know, it. No, I never really understood his need for the struggle mm -hmm. because some of his early, you know, he would do this start of a painting that to me was just so fantastic. And I've experienced that myself. Um, and I couldn't understand why he couldn't just let it go. It just was, it was just, he would often say, it's just too easy. That's just, that was just too easy. We have to make it harder. And um, I never really understood it the whole time through the workshops. But once I started working in the studio, rather than plein air, I finally got it. I, I, I really, I work my paintings, sometimes two or three paintings underneath the final painting. I just keep working them and um, the, um, the experience of that is really fulfilling and I, I, I finally get it. I can't articulate it per se, but I finally get it. And I think of them every time I start painting over another painting. <laughs> um, but I think that was the clearest lesson. If I could, in a nutshell, say what we learned in that workshop is to be fearless take chances and make mistakes. Um, he encouraged that always. Um, and, you know. Yeah, I go. always said, I wish I had the 40 paintings underneath the, the last one, because he just didn't know when to stop half the time, you know. Yeah, there were yeah. a lot of amazing meta metamorphoses going on underneath. Yeah, yeah. Um, the other thing that, some of the other more detailed things that I learned from him, I think was to take a different point of view. That happened early on the first year, um, you know, getting rid of horizons or breaking horizons, um, just being able to let go of the landscape that I was seeing, getting a starting point from what I'm looking at, but then, just responding and, make, and making a painting about 
what it felt like to be in that spot. And um, that was, it took me several years to really grasp that. Um, and um, I, I made the first year, I made some pretty terrible paintings and I was embarrassed to bring them to critique because most of the people were so accomplished. I felt really, I just felt embarrassed. And um, he came over to where I was painting at the Lily Pond one day. I think it was probably like on the Wednesday, middle of the week. And he said, I know you know how to paint. I don't have any question about that. But what I like, and I'd give you an A if I were grading, is that you are really working outside your comfort zone. You're really challenging yourself. And I know you're not happy with your paintings, but I am. Mm -hmm. And um, so that's pretty much why I kept going back. <laughs> um, I just thought that that was very generous of him to recognize that and to make me feel more comfortable. Um, so he was a master of grays also. I think Jill can speak to that as well. Um, you can see it in his own paintings, but I learned a lot about gray um, when I worked with him. I worked, I learned a lot about opposites, you know, making marks that were thin or thick, curvy and straight, you know, just mixing it up made a painting really come to life. Um, and that's an important feature that I learned from him. Um, and taking a chance to surprise yourself. He was always happy to have a little surprise in every painting. So, <laughs> um, uh, yeah, he would often have his um, Titian, a Titian book open to one arabesque or another, you know, and not. Uh, he really worked a lot from um, Renaissance painting, and then he would go hmm, Leger and Hartley and maybe a little Marin, but um, moving on through Picasso, he did a black and white Picasso period and loved um, Van Gogh, started maybe with Van Gogh with his giant portrait, small brush strokes. And then he really ended with de Kooning, which he loved the late de Koonings. And those bowls of paint that he worked with, there is such eloquence in, they look like pretty wild paintings, but it's very hard to do. And John really integrated all that extreme knowledge in these very airy, they're thinner, they're gestural, they pulsate with life. He really did always get the feeling of the place, which I marveled at because um, Maine, Maine was really good for his work and it just, he really got it. Um, on an emotional tenor, which would inhabit the thing. And um, I think he was one of the best painters of America. I just seldom see anyone better. Um, I'm sure a lot of the people will agree with you, Jill. Um, speaking of the painting you're sitting in front of, is in front of, can you tell us a little bit about that painting? This is called Autumn Ramble. And um, I think he started it from a bouquet. It's a studio. Uh, it's probably started outside and then worked in the studio. And um, it's scraped down. Sometimes he would sand them down. He was. He did a whole negative space series of sanding down, and I finally said, John, there's cadmium. You're sanding cadmium. That is not good. Oh, I have a good story. This is Augustine's story. Um, he, <laughs> they were very close, as I said. And when Augustine died, Musa Augustine called John up, and she said, John, come and get 
Phillips were, you know, his, uh, his paint and Belgian canvas and brushes. There's tons of art supplies in the studio in Woodstock. Come and get it. And he just couldn't do it. And then Musa, the wife, died, and Musa, the daughter, did the same thing. She, she said, John, come get it. So John and I went down to Gustin's studio and um, we took shopping bags home of, of paint. And he was taking blues and, you know, cadmiums and all the colors. He didn't take the white because that's, he didn't take the white. We get home and he starts opening up these boxes and they're all cadmium red because Gustin was <laughs> terrified of running out of the base color of his grays and his luscious paint, which was cadmiums. And um, oh. it was really something. Anyway. This has a lot of cadmium, and you know there are there's cadmium buoys all over the island, and um, cadmium red. And he was so thrilled to have <laughs> them to work from. Um, so this is just a rollicking, beautiful, uh, rhythmic, pulsating. You can hear the music, the rock and roll, and you know it's a great. It is an autumn kind of thing. So we we do have a. A little slideshow prepared. Are you ladies ready to look yeah. at some of the work that's in the show? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, this is a beautiful painting in the show. It's actually behind me. I don't know if you could see it uh, during the Zoom talk, but uh, it's called Three Ducks done in 2012. This is a masterpiece, just in case yeah. you don't get that. It, it is an amazing painting. And I really don't remember it being done, so I can't, but there you have the rhythms and the pulsation again. It's just a fabulous painting. Yeah, I don't, um... And the title is interesting. <laughs> John liked ducks. He liked Donald Duck. It was a seminal attraction. <laughs> and uh, I think he just thought it was funny. But there are some, you know, you can interpret some ducks. Uh, in the show, we, we, we have paired Linda's work with uh, John's. And we um, put a few of them together. The, the show came, part of the show came about because um, Daniel Caney, the art critic, former art critic for the Maine Sunday Telegram and the Portland Press Herald, uh, wrote an article for the Portland Magazine called um, Fuel of Influence. And he paired a Packard with Ember. And um, we had been thinking about this before, but then it was like we decided to approach Jill and, and see if we could do a show. Um, about Ember and one of his students. And uh, it's interesting to go through the, the slides here and, and see some of them matched up and you can see the influence. Uh, Linda obviously is doing her own thing as she said the, that uh, Ember had encouraged her. Um, but feel free Linda and Jill to jump in on these paintings. Well, I'll just mention that this one, Remembrance, is actually was just done this past July. Um, the group that was the final group um, as it stood with John's workshop um, has stayed together and we continue to meet at the same week that he had the workplace and paint together. Um, and, you know, I just, I wanted to mention that because this is, to me, it's an important part of his legacy is he had this group that we we continue to learn from each other and influence each other. And um, so this, I think, except for the COVID year when we didn't meet, this is the seventh year that we get together without him. Um, and so this painting was just done this past July. And I was not having a very good week because I don't paint plein air anymore. I only paint when I go to Stonington in July. 
um, plein air and I was having trouble getting my jazz back. And so I finally went to the lily pond where I've always done good paintings and painted there and came up with a decent painting. And it's probably the most representational painting I've done in at least two years. So I think you'll see as we go through the slideshow that it, it kind of looks quite a bit different from some of the other ones that are in the show. But that's how this one came about. It's, it is the only plein air, I believe, in the show, if I'm not mistaken. So um, the Lily Pond, Ames Pond, was a really special place for me um, throughout the whole, um, my whole history with John, so. Yeah, you know, I was thinking about how much he loved teaching and his students loved him and um, he loved them. And he was very excited. I could never figure out why did he interrupt a really good run <laughs> of painting? You know, he'd be on a, a real rhythm painting. And then third week in July, he'd have a class. And, um, but I think, I think it really fed him and to articulate his ideas and exercise that muscle of looking at art, at people's art and giving them everything he knew. It was such fertile and regenerative ground that then would inhabit the paintings that were forthcoming. Um, it, it was a wonderful nurturing cycle, what he gave out and what he got back. Um, and I came to understand that very clearly and even more so now that they've kept coming to reunite and channel John and um, yeah. Let's look at the next one. I just wanna, um, since I'm talking, uh, this is Stonington Harbor. It's such a beautiful painting. And the sureness, this is one of my favorite paintings of Stonington Harbor. And Isla Ho, that big slash of juicy white is articulating the profile of Isla Ho as you look out across this little island that um, is off the fish pier. Um, Jill, I think you said, I don't know if this is one of them, but you said that some of the paintings that are in this show were, were came after his um, time in Ireland. Yeah. Uh, I think so th one yeah, of them, right? This is, um, the year after Ireland, yes. Can you just and, tell us about what was going on in Ireland? And yeah, I touched on it earlier, but um, he, as I mentioned, he was very sick, and he we'd gone to Ireland to to work, so um, he had mixed up bowls in a very de Kooning like manner and a big wide brush, you know, like three inches, on a twenty four by twenty four inch panel of birch, birch ply, gesso many times. And um, he just slashed his way across the landscape. And this one, so he came back to Maine, that was in the spring, May, May, June, and he came up to Deer Isle. And it, he was very excited about painting here with that new methodology. You know, if you could call, you know, he hated methodologies, but um, so that's the wrong word. But um, <laughs> he, you can see it. You can see his excitement and passion in it, and and yet extreme knowledge of negative positive space and how he's, you know, vitalizing the surface. It's a great painting, and that little surprise of the cadmium box in there. Is, <laughs> yeah, is awesome. yeah, that is nice. It really makes the whole painting. If you put your thumb over that spot. Yeah, yeah, it does. And it relates to the island behind it, you know, it bounds in a very kind of Hoffman-esque way. You know, it's, mm -hmm. it's doing the push-pull very well. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Yeah. These uh, next two paintings, I love both of these paintings. Some of my favorites in the show, but uh, it's a nice representation of master and student. 
I um <laughs> this is a late one. It's 2012 of John's and I said I really like morning glories and I grow them and I said, oh, come on, John, just do me a morning glory, would you? And this is the painting he came up with. Um, so that's the trellis, that big wide uh, slash at the bottom is um, the trellis it was growing. But Linda, tell us about Hospa. Well, as interestingly, I think you said the morning glory was a studio painting. Of no, no. Oh. I thought you said that yesterday. Anyway, yeah, the hosta um, was plein air, so I was wrong. I do have some plein air in this show. It's an early one, I think probably 20, uh, I don't know, maybe 2015. It was after John had died, but um, just uh, a friend of mine's garden in Stonington and I just sat there and did a bunch of drawings and um, and then did this painting. Uh, just, I don't know. Well, sort of really beautiful, Linda. I mean, I can't think of anything. I, I mean, I like everything about it. Um, well, it's had several orientations, interestingly. It kind of works in almost every orientation, which always thrills me when that happens. Mm -hmm. um, and I kind of settled on this one just because I had to settle on one, but um, I've had it at home here for quite a while before the show, and I still turned it frequently because I, I really liked it, uh, sometimes with the dark on top. You know, I think, um, so, yeah, so. So the next um, two paintings, uh, both of these are favorites of mine too. Uh, in a whirlwind, whirlwind by Linda Packard and title out John Ember. Stonington has this amazing rocks, you know, um, granite. It's a quarry town, and um, the the way the tide interacts with them is is pretty splendid. And we have friends with amazing properties. And um, he had a couple of favorites. And I'm pretty sure this is a bobsled one with Grog Island behind it. And um, yeah, you can really feel that tide moving in across the ledges. Oh, I just love all the, the swirls in this one. Um, it works really nicely with Linda's. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's really beautiful. These next two, The Dance and Quarry Wood. I let, now Linda, you said this is one of your favorite ember paintings. You wanna just tell us what it is you love about it? Well, the mark making is what I love about it, but also I, I recognize, I, it's a painting that I'd never seen. So that was really exciting in itself. And um, uh, I'm pretty sure it was at Sand Beach. Um, it sure looks like it to me, but um, even if it wasn't, it feels like it to me. So that's always been a favorite place of mine too. But the mark making, and uh, more representation than the late, later paintings. Um, it just, I don't know, makes me feel really um, comfortable. And the pink, I love his use of pink, um, brown pink, but still, um, I don't know. I just gravitated toward it right away when I first saw it. Do you remember that painting, Jill? You know, he did a, when he first, he and Phil Allen started coming to Stoning, Deer Isle and Stonington in the 70s, I think. They came because of Fran Merritt at Haystack and they'd come up in the middle of winter. And he would come up here and he'd do pastel drawings that he would take home and develop into studio paintings. Um, 
working from them, big studio paintings of landscapes. This was a period before I knew him. Um, and many were of big boulders in the woods, like huge diptychs of um, woodland dis diptychs. So it's interesting, this one is 36 by 36 and has that monumentality, but much looser. And um, it's part of a lineage, you know, he worked through, um, as, as do probably, mo if you find a good motif and you explore it throughout your life, revisiting it and trying out, who are you as a painter that year? Um, this next slide, Linda, is a painting that you said was transitional for you. Do you want to just talk? Well, this was, um, I did a bunch of um, small paintings at Sand Beach in 2011. That was the second, be the third year. And I can, I always considered this to be a breakthrough painting. Um, it's the way I wanted to paint. And it took me a couple of years to really sort of get it still after this painting, but I've always kept this painting um, nearby because uh, it represented um, a big breakthrough for me. And John recognized that too. He was, he was elated with this painting. <laughs> And um, part of it came from his direction to, uh, if you're looking at a vista, forget about the vista, look down or look behind you and, and see what's, uh, just get a fresh perspective. And so I was just looking down as the tide was changing rapidly. Um, I think what he liked about it was I, I caught the tide changing. You know, you can feel the movement in this and, um, I wasn't paying any attention to my painting. I was paying attention to what was happening in the water and around the rocks and the feeling of that. And it wasn't till I finished later in the day and I put all the paintings down side by side that I recognized that this is what he was talking about in terms of painting, what it feels like to be there. So um, that's why it's special to me. <laughs> Uh, this next slide is a new painting by Linda Packard, Still Life at the Quarry and Ember's Bob's Ledge, which I guess was a reoccurring theme for, for Ember. Um, and what, one of the things, too, that, that uh, Dan Caney mentioned in this article was that uh, John's paintings were, were, had a chalky consistency to them. Mm -hmm compared to yours, Linda, that are a lot more translucent. Um, and you can see it in some of the, the um, comparisons here of the two paintings side by side. And Jill, do you know how, how he got that kind of chalky effect with his paint? Is it the medium he used or? You know, I'm puzzled by that word. I don't relate to it. So I can't really address it because yeah, I would never call it. I think when I look at the work, um, I don't know. Maybe it's the medium. It's 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 more uh, substantial. The the paint's more substantial. I mean, it feels substantial. I'm not, you know. It I'm, might be that they're done on panel. When you work on panel or or oil primed linen. The paint sits right up on the surface. It doesn't get sucked into. What are you working on, Linda? Well, this one here, I think, is a poor comparison of that idea because to me, this one is, I didn't use very much transparency. Um, this happens to be on Yupo, this painting. Oh, yeah. um, I've been painting more on canvas in recent years just because the bigger I get, the heavier the panels get. And it's, um, easier for me to move them around. So I tried to teach myself to adapt to um, adapt to canvas. But I think I think chalky is an unfortunate word. I think what he was talking about was the the buildup of paint in John's work um, is different than mine. He tends to build 
Um, I start with really thin out. My early paint painting looks more like a watercolor. We actually use the exact same medium. I use John's medium. So it's not the medium. I think I also have always gravitated toward the dark, rich colors, which tend to be transparent. Um, you know, some paint is transparent and some paint is opaque. And I tend to go for the colors that are transparent. So I have just over the years by accident found it pretty exciting to put these um, transparent colors on top of other colors and let them show through. So it's just a different way of paint handling, I think. Um, I, I just found that um, term chalky really unfortunate because I don't think his paintings are chalky at all. Um, he probably uses more white than I do. I've never been very good at using white is the main reason I don't use much white. Um, so I don't know. Um, but I think he builds up his paint differently, you know, um, probably not using as much transparency to start with. Um, I don't know. I, um, well, just a quick story for him to elaborate on his comment in that article. Um, Pardon? I said Dan's not here to comment on his the term he used in that article, but uh, yeah. So just moving on to the next one, uh, this is again Ember's Lily Pond. Um, speaking of the Lily Pond, and um, painting by Linda Home for the Summer. They're very different. They're very different. And this is a better example, maybe, of my use of the transparent colors. Um, this was a, on panel. My painting is on panel here. And a lot of the paint is very, very thin. Um, and his painting is, you know, the, the paint's pretty thick. I think Linda, this is the one I said, I'm pretty certain it was a studio painting. Oh, okay. So we're getting to the end of our time. So we just have two more slides. Um, I love both of these. Glimmers of Hope by Linda Packard and Orange Bar. I love the orange bar there by John Ember. There's just a small line there on the <coughs> bottom left makes that entire painting. I love these two together. <laughs> yeah, I do too. Yeah. yeah. You know, the other thing I wanted to say about John's work, you know, and this one reminds me of it. Um, they're very, up, these landscapes are very abstract, but he has a great space. He, he, he's able to get a great um, perspective in space. You can feel how far out the horizon is. Um, I'm not describing it really well. Some paintings more than others, but uh, when you get far away from the painting, up close it feels just very abstract um, and you don't really see that. But when you get away from them, um, the, the projection of space is, is pretty amazing. And you know, he used only one eye. It, when he'd been working for a while, painting for a while, his right eye would turn in. And so essentially he was using one eye. So you lose all real sense of space when that happens. So it is a construct. And yet he was able to create space um, despite that handicap. Hmm. Um, he, he, and he had tremendous space in his paintings. Right. right. Well, I think the way he really incorporated, uh, you know, the elements of the landscape with the abstract, you know, and his elements are, they're not concrete at all, but you still feel this mm -hmm. landscape, even though there's nothing identifiable per se in any single item. Mm -hmm. uh, That's right. 
yeah taken as a whole they feel landscape like a landscape Yeah, and I don't I don't know of any other artist that does it quite like he does. Yeah. So our last slide here are these two. Uh, the Sunflowers in Summer by Packard and Flowers 3 by Ember. Both flowers. The palettes in these two are very related. <laughs> yeah, they are. They are. But I will say it probably took me a lot longer to get to the end of mine than it took for him to get to the end of his. <laughs> I have a lot of pain underneath that um, final painting. Well, it's just, it's just amazing to watch him paint too. I mean, when he when he was, you know, making a mark, and it looks like it's going to be nothing, and you're just wondering what's going on in his brain while he's putting his brush to the canvas and then all of a sudden it's it just you know emerges as this thing um it's really quite fascinating and you know that main masters movie by dick kane of uh, ember's left hand if you haven't seen it yet you should definitely go on amazon or whatever and um he just poured his knowledge into that movie and you do get to see him painting and it's really exciting. And you get to see the, the sequences and how they start one place and then they end a totally different place. It's very exciting. It's a great movie. We have a question from Steve. Uh, go ahead, Steve. You can unmute yourself. Yes, uh, first of all, thank you. It's a great program and hello, Jill. Uh, could John have done any of this without being a teacher? Was it so important that he teach? No. I mean, it seems like to be a huge part of his life. What would have happened if he wasn't teaching? John, Rhetorical question. He <laughs> seldom taught. He would, never made a living teaching. He was primarily a painter and he would teach one week and Wednesday nights at Harvard. Uh, he taught intermittently. He taught many places, but would do it for a semester, a summer school, sometimes a year. The year we had Gabe, he was teaching and we bought a house and the bank looked at us for a year. <laughs> and uh, So no, teaching was an anomaly basically. He enjoyed it, but it was uh, not a big part of his life. Hi, Martha. Hi. Hi, Jill. Um, great, great story, you guys. It's wonderful bringing John back to life. And it's so nice to hear you and um, Linda talk about the work. Um, it's so inspiring. And Karen, thanks for hosting. So I have a question for Linda. And um, Linda, John always had a lot of great sayings for us, um, you know, just tips and things to ponder and and we all wrote them down, you know, religiously every every July. <laughs> Is there one that sticks in your mind that was you hear over and over again from John? Yeah, um, make the sky your own, number one. <laughs> Always remember that, especially when, obviously when I'm painting outdoors. Um, and also, don't be stingy with your paint. Mm -hmm. Used to always get on me because. I'm, I'm cheap, but I don't want to waste paint. And it took me a long time to get over the fact that you've got to waste some paint to make good painting. Um, rubbing it out, scraping it out, whatever you've got to do, you've got to do it. And so I think those two things, I hear him over my shoulder a lot of times if I'm getting a little too stingy with my paint or um, and make the sky your own. It's just I just translate that to uh, forget about being faithful to whatever you're painting. If you're painting from life, just get a starting point and then just add and omit and change and you know at random and with gusto. Just not worry about it. Um, so yeah, 
I guess when we were talking yesterday, you said there were a whole series of emberisms, and maybe next year when the group meets, you'll you'll um, start to. Yeah, write. everybody has their own list too, I think. And I was trying to find one somebody sent, um, but I, I was never able to find it. But um, you know, um, yeah, it's a good question. Do you have one, Martha? Oh, well, she's gone. Yeah, I do. I have the list on my studio wall and I read it. Oh, you do? Oh. Yeah, daily. And, uh, you know, I think, you know, Make the Sky Your Own is a good one that sticks in me too. But so. Well, Martha, what's your favorite one? Um, oh, there's so many. It depends on the day and what I'm struggling with <laughs> in the studio. <laughs> but, you know, John was wonderful and um, really supporting us. and you know, giving us faith in our painting. And so I will be forever grateful for that. And the, the part about um, preciousness, he was, he was really in tune to looking at your work when you were working on it in the middle of a painting and um, being able to detect the precious part that you were working <laughs> on. Yeah. And um, so many times he would come up to me and he said, you really like that part, don't you? <laughs> And I'd say, well, yes, I do. And he said, well, get rid of it right now because it's never going to work. And he's always been right about that. And so I do hear that over my shoulder too. If I get too caught up in um, loving something, um, that's a real good one too. Uh, Jody, you have a question? Yeah, I wondered if John listened to music while he painted. Yeah, he always listened to music, either classical or rock and roll. And uh, this is in the studio paintings. It just got him, juiced him up, got him going. He danced, yeah. he'd move around. Hey, Adam. Um, so uh, uh, we we need to go to Adam. Um, excuse me. Um, yes, he loved music. Not outside, he, what he didn't. I just noticed... Um, Adam Eddy is a wonderful painter who helped John paint at the in the ALS period. And John wouldn't be able to speak and Adam understood him and intuited. They were, what a team. I mean, do you have anything to say, Adam? <laughs> well, hi, first of all. It's been um, a yeah. long time since we've seen each other. Um, but yeah, I, I would say, I kind of just want to reiterate what some people were saying about John's attitude, like sort of towards the the act of painting itself. I think that he was someone that sort of like, it was nice if you ended the day with like a good painting, but it was almost the activity of painting itself that was the, the point, you know what I mean? And I feel like learning that, like me getting to work with him when his body was deteriorating and it was like one of the only things he could look forward to during the day, I sort of like really learned that lesson in a very like intense way that it's like the experience of color itself, the experience of like, seeing the the subjects that came in for you know to have their portraits painted or flowers or whatever it sort of was like just being there in the moment was as important to him I think as what he actually ended up making which to me was hugely um sort of influential to how I approach my own work so I don't know if anyone else can can relate to that to that lesson but I, that's kind of like the big thing that I feel like I learned from him in my time thank you thank you uh, Jonathan do you have a question I do. Thank you so much for a lovely, lovely program. And hello, Jill, uh, calling from the West Coast and I'm driving, so I can't really show you my face. But I guess my simple question is, was John a planner? Uh, Linda, also, how do you, was John a planner? And if John was a planner, did he go to a place and say, I'm going to paint this today or this morning or within three hours? And Linda, how do you handle that? And Jill, I also would like to know about you. Do you think about that? Or is it, maybe it'll be tomorrow. Maybe it'll be next week. Ha, I don't think, well, John didn't like to figure out where he was gonna go. He had a couple of places that are phenomenal and he just would go there every day, one or the other. They're both down, you know, they're nearby and, he maximized his time. He didn't have to think about it. And he, huh, there are hundreds of paintings of those places and they're all different. And um, yeah, 
So I have a list of paintings in my mind and I'll just sort of think, okay, I'm gonna go there. Based on the day, I'll figure it out. And then as often as not, I'll see something on my way there and I'll just go, you better do it now because uh, <laughs> you've got a blank in the car. And so I pretty much am open to the moment. Um, and what about the idea of the realism versus the impression of the day? Make the sky your own. I love that. But so does he go to it, look at a, a, a view and say, I'm going to do this with this view? Or is it really more of a, an abstract idea? And I'll take whatever I take and go on from there. Yeah, I think he thought, what does the painting need? What will surprise me? What will make this a vital experience? Sometimes it was based on stuff he saw and sometimes it was just what the painting wanted. Um, he was very open to impulse. Yeah, Linda, what would you say? Yeah, I agree with that. I, that's my impression of how he painted. He would go to a place, I'm gonna paint here today, but not really know what he was gonna use for, um, uh, a starting point until he got there. And that's pretty much the way I approached the plein air too. And I think it's probably from his influence. Um, I would paint um, at the lily pond probably half of the whole week. Um, I would do paintings there. And every time it would be a different kind of painting and different perspective. And I wouldn't really decide until I got there and saw what the light was like. And um, so, uh, yeah, I don't think that, either of us were much planners. And I'm certainly not a planner in the studio either. I usually start by just making a bunch of marks on the canvas and then seeing what happens after that. Um, I don't usually have a plan. So it's more exciting that way. Harder maybe, but more exciting, <laughs> yeah. Uh, we have a question from Alice. Go ahead, Alice. Hi, Hi. can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, I was just wondering about the format. Most of the paintings that you showed are square. And was that a favorite of his and um, and yours also and, and, and Linda's? John loves squares. You know, they're the toughest because everything's equal. So you have to throw it off. Somehow you have to throw the balance off. And um, he often painted in squares. Linda, what do you say? Yeah, I mean, I started painting in squares when I started studying with John to challenge myself because it's pretty easy to paint a landscape when you have a landscape proportion canvas. Um, it's really hard to paint a landscape on a square. And so I, that was just another element that I added into the whole challenge. Um, and then once I started that, I loved the square. And I've recently kind of gotten away from the square a little bit because I was seeing everything as square. Um, and it became easy for me to paint on square. So now I've moved to, um, he also liked double square, which I've never been able to master. But yeah, it started for me as a challenge and, and then it just became natural, my natural go-to proportion. Uh, Jan, you have a question? Hi, yes, everybody. This has just been delightful, and I've always been a big fan of John's and Linda's work, and um, it's great to see you all and hear you talk. I had a question. I First of all, I like chalky. <laughs> so, um, you know, I I don't know that I feel his paintings were chalky, but um, say they were, do you think it has something to do with the medium that he used? And I was wondering if anyone sort of realized what medium he did use. Well, I use the same medium that he does. Um, he had a recipe for his medium and shared it with us all. And some of us continued to use it and some of us didn't. Um, it's part of how he got that juicy, drippy paint. Um, but it has certainly doesn't have anything to do with this so-called chalkiness. <laughs> um, uh, I really, I still don't really see that, but um, uh, 
I don't think it was chalky as, as being gouache, which has a chalkiness. Yeah, yeah. Chalky. Well, it has a chalkiness. Yes, you're uh, absolutely. John's right. surfaces have a varnish. You know, it's implicit. He uses galkid, which is a kind of um, varnish, and it's part of the medium. Um, so there is a there is a lustrous quality to the surfaces. Did you say he used a, a glaze or a gloss, Jill? I couldn't hear what you said there. Yeah, he uses a galkid medium um, as part of the mix. Stand oil, galkid, and um, I, t and I took the chalky, the chalky comment as a compliment. Um, yeah, well, let's move away from it because we yeah. don't agree with it. <laughs> yeah, maybe that's just a word that people are struggling with, but I, I think it's the thickness of the paint that he uses. You know, yeah, on the panel. What would you say, Adam? Yeah, I was going to say, I've, I've mixed a lot of paint and medium for him, and it's, um, so he used a combination of Gamsol or uh, odorless mineral spirits, Galkid and Stand Oil together um, in sort of a combination. It kind of has this, like, a slightly looser texture than something like honey, um, and so what that does is when he would mix it up into these bowls, uh, he could, like, really low to brush down with it and then basically lay it right on top of the layers underneath without the layers mixing. And so it has to do with the viscosity of his medium. Um, so he's almost more painting, like he was like icing a cake almost more than like drawing or something. Um, so that, I would say that's kind of what contributes to the sort of like highly textured sort of uh, physical materiality of his surfaces. Yeah, he would pour the medium right into his bowl of paint and yeah. um, mix it in. Um, which, yeah, it contributed to that thick, um, no brush strokes really, just like lay it on. Um, uh, if there aren't any more questions or if Linda or Jill have one more comment they'd like to make before we sign off. No, thanks for coming everybody. And um, thanks for coming. Nice to talk about John. Yeah, it's one, and it's a great show. So check it out. Thank you. And I, I hope you get a chance to watch the um, documentary, uh, Ember's Left Hand. You can Google it and get it online really easily.